Hello. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, tailing, tailoring your message for your target audience. And so we talked a little bit about this in class, and certainly we've touched on identifying a specific target audience. Uh, but if you think about it, uh, up until now, we've we've talked about you know farmers or woodland owners or policymakers. Um, youth, teachers, you know, those kinds of things, but uh, they're really not all the same, right? And so there's different things we can ask about them to maybe help us focus in our message or maybe even our approach to what we're doing. Uh, so you think about like who they are, uh, where they go for information, right? So this might, that might dictate um, uh, kind of who you might partner with. Uh, it could be uh, um, the motivation for doing it that could help kind of inform your uh, your advertising or your message. Uh, how do they interpret that information? Factors that go into their decision making. So I'm going to kind of kind of touch on all these things uh, regarding woodland owners because that's who I work with a lot, and kind of use this as an example to kind of get you thinking about some of the things you might consider uh, about your target audience for your extension delivery. So there's a lot of factors we can look at for, for woodland owners, you know, how long they've owned the woods, whether they live on the property or they live somewhere else, uh, uh, acreage, the size of the parcel, that's certainly one thing that's been looked at for, for a long time. And so if you look at the acres uh, in Indiana, uh, uh, it's really a widespread, but most of the acres acreage are really held by people that have 20 or more uh, acres in their parcel. So in other words, uh, most of the land is actually owned by a smaller percentage of property. And that's important for a couple of different reasons. One, you can think of it from, uh, if you really wanna have an impact in terms of the acres of forest, uh, you really might wanna focus more on those larger scale uh, owners in terms of, of having that, that impact, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean the smaller uh, parcels aren't, aren't important as well. You might think of that as if you're looking at forest policy or some type of a policy level impact, uh, then, somehow broadening your scope to, to the whole diversity of woodland owners might be a better approach uh, in that regard. But really where, where it comes down to it for, from a lot of us is that it's really a good predictor of doing some activities, but not, not all activities. So for example, if I was doing a program on, on timber harvesting and I had a bunch of people in there who were small parcel woodland owners, it's probably not going to be appropriate for them or really have an impact because most of those small acreage owners really don't do any level of timber harvesting. Uh, and, and that's really a predictor. So uh, uh, every so often, um, the U.S. Forest Service does a, a national survey of, of woodland owners. And so they've kind of, if you look at the, the, the data they collect, uh, it's really a, a correlated, basically, if you have the, 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 the increasing in size of the parcel, is really in terms of uh, percentage of respondents who, who harvest timber, okay? Some things like harvesting firewood or other things really aren't a predictor of size, but, but certainly that's really important for some things, including management plans and tax programs. And so kind of knowing your audience, maybe targeting to a certain uh, size of, of, of a group is important. This by, uh, by means is also one of the reasons why that a lot of state agencies and cost share programs will focus more or have some kind of a min minimum acreage limit uh, uh, requirement to, to participate because small acreage landowners, just because of the issues with scale and things like that, just don't have the ability or the interest in doing things. So you can look at this kind of information. And so these are a few different data sources. This is from the, uh, this is older data, but it's pretty similar across years and regarding woodland owners uh, in terms of some of the, the, the basics about them. This was a publication about Indiana woodland owners done by a graduate student at Purdue uh, a while back. And not too long ago, uh, I'm a part of the Indiana Woodland Steward Institute, and we surveyed readership of that publication, and we collected some information. And so when you look at things like parcel size or the years of ownership, uh, whether the percentage that had a written management plan, the percentage that were enrolled in some type of a program, be it classified forest or, or, or a farm bill, those kinds of things, and then the percent had uh, conservation easements, those really vary dependent on the information source. So you got to know a little bit about that. Now, this is Indiana and this is Indiana, and those are really dramatically different. And probably the thing that drives that is a lot of the, uh, the readership um, the way we, we get our roles of, of addresses and things, we, we use the classified uh, woodland owners database. And so when they get new classified owners in that database, every so often uh, we use those, that information to, to increase our, our, our 
date. And so by by default, if you're in that program, you have a management plan, right? And so some of these things are are, are inflated because of that. So uh, when you're looking at information sources and things like that, having an understanding about how they were formed is really, really important. The other thing we can look at is why someone owns woodlands, right? And so these are things from, this is Indiana, but this is these are the similar questions and, and categories. In fact, they are the same categories that they use in the National Woodland Owner Center uh, Survey. And so a lot of the reasons that are important to people uh, about woodlands is really re uh, related to beauty, scenery, nature, wildlife, those kinds of things. Uh, timber and kind of those, those consumptive kind of a, a uses are really pretty low on the list when it comes to woodland owners. So that's important, right? And so there's been efforts to take like all this kind of demographic information and all these, these values and, and things about woodland owners and kind of combine all those into a simple data set to basically try and identify clusters or segments of woodland owners that you can target information to. And so there's been different states studies have done these, but the, the national one that was done uh, uh, many years ago by uh, Butler and colleagues, they identified four groups of segments. And so basically the retreat owners, the working on the land, supplemental income, and also the uninvolved. And so if, you know, it just, they all kind of share generally common characteristics in terms of that, right? So the income people, they really put a high importance on financial reasons in terms of maybe as a land investment, uh, also harvesting timber for income, those kinds of things. Some people have woodland woodlands and really just, they might not have them. So for example, like a lot of farmers, uh, they might have a small uh, woodlot, you know, in Northern Indiana, and it's probably a woodlot because it, it's a pretty wet area. And so it's not farmed. And so they just kind of kept it as a woods. They don't use it for anything else. And so it's just kind of a part of their farm, right? And so you kind of think about these different segments and you might craft messages or programs, the focus of those programs differently, depending on which uh, subgroup that you're working with. Another thing we can think of are information sources, right? So in extension, we're providing information in some fashion or form, right? And so there's a lot of work done looking at use and preference and trust and things like those things. Uh, so this was from a survey of, of class participants uh, from the, uh, the eight week forestry short course. It's a, a program, longstanding program done by our department. And so we surveyed them uh, a few years back and asked about information use and preference. And so not surprisingly, the traditional type things, uh, newsletters, fact sheets, extension, workshop, those were kind of the higher things in terms of what they used. Uh, and then some of the lower things in terms of in-person communication. There's also other things that were much, much lower on the, on the, the list, you know, things like uh, social media and, and those kinds of things. Um, and if you think about the demographics of woodland owners, where they're generally much older on average in terms of their, their, their age and things like that, it's not too surprising what they, they really prefer to use and, 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 and that kind of thing when it comes to information sources. <clears throat> the other thing you can think about, too, though, is that uh, about management decisions, right? And so, you know, in our logic model, that middle term income, there's there's behaviors there. So there's practices, whether that's uh, creating a management plan, doing some type of evasive species control, you get the idea, right? And so how do these different groups affect uh, woodland management decisions, right? So that's really important. And so when you look at the strongly and moderate influence groups, things like a professional forester, uh, Purdue Extension, uh, were really high, but also family, right? And so family is a really kind of important thing. And so there's been a lot of work done with social networks with not only farmers, but also woodland owners and the importance of those networks and how they communicate and, and that, how that helps them form decisions on their property. You know, so those things were really uh, important. But one thing that kind of really stands out about this is all these different groups, whether it be soil and water conservation districts, woodland owner organizations, advisors, friends, neighbors, they've pretty much got some level of influence for almost every single woodland owner, right? Uh, so that's really, really kind of imp important from that standpoint. So in other words, they're, they're getting their information from a lot of, a lot of sources. <clears throat> so think about the, that logic model, right? And so, you know, we've got some inputs and we do some activities and for this target audience. And as a result, they learn some things, they do some things and some conditional uh, 
response happens as a result of those behaviors, okay? But if you think about it, uh, you know, in, the, in those behaviors, these are the kind of things that we're interested in from a woodland management perspective, right? And so if people have a plan and they have professional advice, the thinking is, is that they're going to make um, better decisions in terms of their property, in terms of meeting what their goals and objectives are, and it's going to be better long-term and, and, and environmental outcome as well from that standpoint. Uh, and then we also always look at adopting practices, although I would argue that maintaining a practice is just as important uh, for, from that standpoint. But we'll, we'll stick to the adoption part, right? So we're assuming they're not doing something and we're going to teach them something, uh, some information that they're going to go out and do it. But what really motivates them and influences their decision in order to do that, right? That's always the kind of the key. Uh, uh, and the logic model really doesn't help us with that. Uh, so sometimes what we look at is actually different uh, uh, social theories out there, right? And so the diffusion of innovation has been around a long time. It's applied to extension and educational programs quite a bit. Uh, it also is applied to a lot of different other things. So basically the premise is, is that uh, you have this new technology or this innovation and uh, you have some innovators who are always kind of early adopters that adopt new things. They want to try new things. And so they do that. And then through the communication of the social network of these different groups in terms of uh, 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 people who are adopt that innovation, it kind of diffuses throughout the social network and over time adoption increases, right? And so there's this decision-making process about learning about it, uh, deciding whether or not you're gonna implement it and then you implement that and then you, you, you validate whether that was a good thing or not and you continue to practice, uh, practice or you, or you um, uh, ceased doing it, right? But there's things that 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 affect that, and so it's really kind of from a woodland owner perspective. Again, that's that. Well, this is the example that I'm using. There's there's things to kind of think about, right? And so part of it might be uh, the characteristics of that innovation. And so innovation in this context would be, say, controlling invasive species, harvesting timber, uh, uh, having a management plan, those kinds of things. And so uh, it, do they? And they see the advantage of, of adopting that practice. Uh, is it compatible with what they do or their value system, right? Uh, is it uh, very complex? Is it hard to do? Can they test it out? Can you just try it on a, on a small basis before you adopt it on a large basis? So you can imagine those things, some of them would be yes and some of them would be no, right? You can't test out a 10 acre clear cut, you know, and then be like, oh, I don't like it. And you're, you're kind of stuck with it, right? And so that's why those, those large scale type things are really uh, having demonstrations and looking at time sequences of those practices and, and the outcomes of them are really, really important from that standpoint, uh, uh, you know, from, from there. You know, invasive species is another one, right? And so when, when I'm talking about invasive species control, if I'm working with people who have managed woodlands in the past, for example, they've done timber stand improvement, which part of that practice involves the use of herbicides to kill grapevines and other things that compete with the trees and can cause issues. Uh, and so they're already using herbicides. And so if I'm talking about doing herbicide use to kill invasive plants, they already had that skill. It's compatible with not only their uh, perception about that practice, if it's okay or not, but they've already got the equipment and all that kind of stuff. Uh, some people have a very negative perception of herbicides and will not use them, okay? And so if I'm talking about herbicide control for invasives, uh, it's never going to connect with that individual because of that, because of that belief, okay? It's just not compatible. And so there's all those kinds of things to kind of think about, and it's kind of an interesting process. Uh, there's other theories out there in terms of that. So the theory of planned behavior, if it's often been applied to woodland management and other natural resources practices, because you know some behaviors people do, like uh, uh, you know smoking, drug use, all those kinds of things, it might be kind of a spur of the moment, peer pressure, all those kinds of things play into effect, social norms, all those kinds of things, right? But with the natural resource management, the thought is it's more of a kind of a thought out plan behavior. And so there's, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, model, basically there's three things that are important. The attitude towards the behavior, uh, the perceived norm. So is it the right thing to do? And do people who I respect or that are doing that practice as well? And then their perceived control or, or ability to do that, 
for that practice, right? And so those are those are all important things, and they they all kind of lead to that behavioral intention, which is a good predictor of the actual behavior. And so these are kind of things. It's important because then you think about values in terms of why they own woodlands. Um, you think about uh, their ability to do that behavior uh, in terms of maybe uh, invasive species control or, or other things. And then the norm is, is you know, important in terms of it's something that they should, should do. So just to kind of give you an example of, of kind of how those things might play into to woodland owner uh, and, and how they manage their woods. Uh, we did some interviews with some course participants of that same eight week course that I mentioned earlier. And we asked them a bunch of things. And so these are just a couple of quotes that I kind of pulled out here just to kind of uh, uh, relate to the point. And so we were asking them about controlling invasive species. And so uh, what we found was it was really uh, a lot of the woodland owners after the course were doing it. And a really important driver of that really seemed to be that they felt like that they should go out to do that, that they weren't a good steward if they weren't if they ignored the problem. And so that kind of a, um, that normative of pressure was really important to them about what it is to be a good woodland owner, a good steward. And so that was really uh, important to them. Also keep in mind that most people have woodlands uh, because of nature and beauty, right? And so if these things conflict with those, uh, that's also another important driver to that. Uh, well, timber harvesting is always an interesting thing because you have some people that do it and some people that don't. It's not a continual kind of a process. You might harvest timber once and then you might not do it again for 10, 15, 20 years, right? So it's a little bit different in that regard. But for those who didn't do any timber harvesting after the course, um, these were the things that really kind of uh, were really common kind of the themes in that were basically they understood that they could get money from it. They understood the, the wildlife benefits and other, other things from a forest regeneration standpoint, but they didn't do it because they didn't want to mess with it or just it wasn't uh, attractive after that. So basically they decided not to, at least up to this point, right? Uh, but those that said yes to it, uh, it kind of really related to the almost that um, uh, the, the invasive species control in that, um, you know, they wanted to, you know, the, the growth of the trees was really important. So it kind of related to that, uh, the health and function of the woods. It wasn't exactly the same as kind of being a good steward, but, but that was a big part of it. And then also was like not being wasteful, right? So that tree is going to die at some point, even though dead trees do have wildlife value and other things, right? But, but that was a kind of important driver, like not being wasteful, like you're basically wasting money if you don't, if you don't harvest those trees uh, uh, from that standpoint. So the nice thing about woodlands and woodland management is there's some resources out there that kind of really takes all this information that I talked about or just touched on about really and puts it in some really handy guides in terms of, of different audience groups related to woodlands, whether it be policy people, whether it be woodland owners, whether it be professionals, uh, and they talk about kind of strategies on, on how you might approach communication with them regarding young forests. And so this is one of those kind of word choice, right? So Professionals like me, we always talk about uh, early successional forest, which is, uh, you know, the plant stage of after you harvest timber, uh, but that really doesn't resonate with people. So people, young forest, they can kind of understand like you're just talking, it's still a forest, it's just a very young forest, right? And so that's kind of like uh, one of the themes of that. So I did provide this PDF in the uh, handouts for this week, and then I also provided a link to the Tools for Engaging Landowners Effectively website. They've got a lot of information on communication and education for woodland owners. So it's kind of, kind of neat from that standpoint. Um, there are other things out there for, for farmers and for um, issues like water quality. Those are probably two, two big ones out there from that standpoint. Uh, but, but again, this is kind of my background, so I'm just sharing this with you. The other thing for, from our perspective is education, right? So a lot of extension, we do some type of an educational program. Right? We're teaching, we're just not teaching a classroom. And so that was kind of an important part. We always, we asked them about, you know, what is their interest in woodland education? What got them started and things? And so again, it was, they wanted to be better stewards, take better uh, care of the, the, the woods, uh, the, the, the norm that, well, I should know more about it. I know other woodland owners that know more than I do. And, and I think I need to kind of bring myself up to speed, you know, that kind of a thing. And so it was kind of interesting from, from that standpoint uh, uh, regarding education. 
So really, you know, I want to close this up and, and the take home message for you, obviously, a lot of you aren't doing woodland owner education and that's perfectly fine, right? Uh, but this gives you an idea of kind of the different things that people that do ed- uh, extension work with woodland owners kind of consider when we're putting it together a program uh, or, or talk uh, from that standpoint. So really the take home message for you is no, number one, know your audience, right? So, so again, a lot of our graduate students have done some type of a presentation to non-scientific audiences. And so if you're doing that and someone else is hosting it and you're just showing up delivering the talk, that's perfectly fine. I would find out more from that host or the host organization who exactly comes to these things, what's their background, uh, can you give me a better idea uh, from that kind of a thing? Okay, so it's okay to ask about that. That's That really helps you tailor your presentation uh, from that standpoint. Again, review the literature. So you're doing lit reviews and things for your research proposal and, and, and all those kinds of things. But there's also literature on communication and all these kinds of things I mentioned for not only woodland owners, but also farmers and things like that in, in, in the peer review journals. And so something like that is really a kind of a value. If you're looking for a communication guide on a particular thing and you're having trouble finding it, um, you know, I might be able to help help you focus on that uh, from that standpoint, or at least maybe uh, connect you with a, a resource person who, who is in that field. Uh, so just think about that. Um, and then focus your key messages, right? And do it appropriately. And so think about your audience and what type of things resonate with them. And when you do your messaging, really try and focus on that. And again, if you're able to get communication guides related to that topic or that audience group, uh, that really they've done the work for you. So that's that's really beneficial from that standpoint. And then finally, really reconsider those if then statements. And so in other words, if they attend this program and they learn this, then they're going to do this. And then as a result, there's some kind of conditions is going to result from that, right? And so think about your outcomes and if those assumptions are going from short to medium to long, if they're actual re- reasonable. And if not, are there some things that you're assuming in, in that 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 maybe you don't have listed in your assumptions, right? So just kind of think about it from that standpoint. And I think it'll really kind of help you refine those outcomes a, a little bit better in terms of what, what you want to achieve. So that's it. And uh, look forward to seeing you in class. See you.